Did me, Balboa. All right. I just had to do that in honor of uh, this being about the Cold War and whatnot. Um, welcome to uh, one of the very last uh, installments of Lobezy. Lectures by Lobezy. Got to talk about lots of things tonight. Lots and lots of things give my little babies an opportunity to to, to fly, all right? So we're going to talk about all kinds of things. I think maybe I'll move over here. All right, how's that? All right, well, need to talk about the Cold War, talk about the causes of the Cold War. Uh, as you can see right there, it's the Soviet Union versus the, the United States wearing this hat tonight in honor of... Uh, it being about the Cold War. Anyway, uh, 1945 to 1991 picks up uh, right after World War II. We need to talk about some of the causes. Uh, prior to the end of World War II, uh, the United States, Great Britain, Great Britain, and uh, the Soviet Union. So that would be Roosevelt, Churchill, and uh, Joseph Stalin. We're all allied against uh, na the Nazis, all right? And they was trying to figure out a way to uh, defeat them. And that was job one. And so they had a bunch of conferences uh, towards the end of the war uh, trying to figure out how they was going to beat uh, the Soviet or how they were going to beat Nazi Germany. And then after they defeated Germany, how they were going to uh, de defeat the Japanese. Uh, and so um, these were a series of conferences that... Uh, well, late in World War II, after this uh, German invasion of the Soviet Union faltered, uh, they lost all the ground that they had gained in Eastern Europe, the Germans did. And uh, the Soviet Union occupied a bunch of, uh, a bunch of that territory. And uh, what the United States and Great Britain came to learn during these uh, conferences, the Yalta Conference, well, first the Tehran Conference, the Yalta Conference, and then the Potsdam Potsdam conference was that the uh, Soviet Union wasn't going anywhere and uh, since um, we needed their help uh, well, we thought at the time to defeat uh, the Japanese um, well we we didn't have much leverage they had the leverage and so we had to pretty much allow them to stay in the in the territories and I'll show you here in a map shortly that the territories that they controlled after uh, World War II <clears throat> kind of promised to uh to have free elections and whatnot but they didn't and the the argument that they used that stalin used was that they needed to have a giant buffer zone uh, against future uh western aggressions right so that's basically what's going on in these two conferences um and then also um the question of reparations came up uh at the at the Potsdam conference and uh, Joseph Stalin, because of the uh, damage done to the Soviet Union, he wanted to exact a very uh, painful and large indemnity against Germany. That was a big sticking point. So what they decided to do was to divide up Germany and let each country have kind of like a sphere of influence. And if they wanted to exact a... And uh, you know, draw some kind of payment from them. They can do that, and so that's how uh, Germany came to be divided up. Uh, at any rate, <clears throat> kind of getting ahead of myself, but I'm gonna go ahead and do it anyway because I'm the boss and I can do whatever I want. All right. So what they decided to do up there at Potsdam is to divide Germany up like so. Uh, I'm not exactly sure why they gave a zone to the French because the French didn't do diddly squat during the war. They got knocked out. 1940 by July 1940 
So they didn't do diddly squat, but they got themselves a zone. So did the British and then the Americans and then the eastern part portion of the country uh, went to uh, went to the Soviet Union. So the Soviet Union disassembled a bunch of factories uh, after they got done raping just about every German woman they can find and took with them all the supplies back to the Soviet Union and uh, used it to help rebuild our country. Uh, the Western countries uh, decided to reunite their uh, sections and create a, what became known as Western Germ West Germany. And then uh, the Soviet zone became known as East Germany. Uh, they did the same thing for the capital. So the capital falls inside of Berlin. They did the same doggone thing. They divided it up. Um, so even though this is West Berlin, it still falls within the Soviet-controlled portion of, uh, of Germany. Uh, once we kind of realized, well, that uh, the Soviet Union wasn't going to be uh, a friend of uh, the West, that they were, in fact, going to be a... Uh, 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 well, I don't want to say... Uh, an enemy, but they were certainly antagonistic, right? And that they had designs on uh, exerting control over uh, Eastern Europe and uh, eventually gobble up <clears throat> the rest of uh, West Europe. So the United States really was going to be uh, uh, a ball of work against preventing that. And uh, this here right here is a uh, little... Uh, visual representation of the United Nations and some of the things that um, it's responsible for, but probably the most important is the uh, Security Council, all right? It's a, uh, I don't know, I got about 15 people, I think, total on the uh, countries representing the Security Council, and 10 of them are on a, a rotating basis. And they determine whether or not force should be applied against a country to maintain collective security. But the way that the uh, United Nations was drawn up, there were five permanent members of the Security Council. And each one of them had veto power. And uh, the Soviet Union, China... Uh, United States, uh, Great Britain, and uh, who else? Oh, I guess the Frenchies were on there. Is that right? I guess. I guess that's who. Anyway, uh, so the UN was never going to be a useful tool to help prevent Soviet aggression. So we was going to be kind of out of luck with that one. Uh, Winston Churchill got invited by uh, the American president, uh, Truman. Um, to come on to the United States after he got uh, voted out of office. And that's a doggone shame. That's a little side story. That man is responsible for helping win the war and defeat the, the Nazis. And you know how they repay him? They vote him out of office. That's a, that is a crime if I've ever seen one. But anyway, don't get me started. At any rate. The Labor Party took over and voted him out of office. So he came to the United States, gave a speech. In fact, came to Missouri, uh, the home state of our president, uh, and and talked about how a, uh, a curtain, an iron curtain, had descended across Eastern Europe, uh, under which the people would live under the yoke of. Uh, oppression by the uh, the Soviet Union and so he was making reference uh, to all the uh, countries in Eastern Europe that Soviet Union occupied after World War II and that they weren't willing to relinquish and that these all all the all these countries would not have free elections in fact they would have uh, rigged elections and communist parties established and they would be the ruling party and they would be sort of under the thumb of the mother country Soviet Union so this speech here really kind of identifies really early on that the Soviet Union, even though they were our ally during World War II, were no friend to the West. Uh, this fellow right here, George Kennan, is responsible for coming up with the uh, United States and 
by extension, Western Europe's foreign policy uh, vis-a-vis the Soviet Union, that was going to be containment, the policy of containment. So it was just going to try to design that. Uh, you know, got to kind of think of it in this regard as like a cancer. And the, the, the doctor is designed, it's, it's not going to, they're not going to be able to get rid of it. They just want to try to prevent the spread of it. So uh, that was the, um, the goal. And early on, it was uh, developed or tested two examples would be the Truman Doctrine and the Marshall Plan and this is immediately following the end of the war 1946 and into 47 we've got uh, two countries Turkey and Greece um, wobbly uh, almost ready to uh, fall to uh, Soviet influences uh, there's a term that should be now, it's called the fifth column. If you're interested in knowing what a fifth column is, I recommend you look it up, but I'm not going to go into it right now. But we've always talked about how the Soviet or Russia wanted to have access to the warm water ports of the Black Sea and the Bosporus Strait. So that kind of gives the, uh, the reason why uh, they were interested in um, seeing these two countries fall and hopefully uh, flip to the Soviet side. But uh, the United States... Uh, took the lead and offered $400 million in military aid to, uh, to fight off the, uh, these like uh, communist insurgents inside the country. And then George Marshall, who was uh, the Supreme Allied commander at the, Allo- at the end of World War II, um, he becomes the Secretary of State under Truman after the war, and he tours Western Europe and sees all the devastation and destruction and human suffering. Uh, and it's just all bombed out, and uh, he, you know, uh, says the United States needs to do something just from a humanitarian standpoint. Uh, so we, Congress uh, votes to uh, come up with $13 billion, which was uh, $13 billion, not a lot of money these days, uh, but it was a lot back then, so we're talking about like in the trillions, uh, probably right about a trillion dollars. It'd probably be about, yeah, that'd be about right, just under a trillion Anywho, uh, we offered all this money to these countries to uh, rebuild. And we also, if you look here, you don't see any of these Eastern European countries. That don't mean that we didn't offer it. The Soviet Union wouldn't allow them to take it because they said that uh, the the United States would use that against them to make them a slave to the West. So um, we offer quite a bit of money to these countries. Uh, Great Britain, uh, shoot, and they get to butt the... They kind of get the lion's share of it. France gets a, quite a bit. So does West Germany. Uh, at any rate, um, it's it's worth noting that um, these countries were very uh, vulnerable to uh, the rise of communism in their own countries, political parties. And so to avoid that, it was decided that this economic aid would help them recover faster and that would uh, stave off any kind of... Uh, Soviet or communist advance in their country. So there you have it. That's about all I got to say about that. All right, moving on. Uh, So Joseph Stalin tried to test uh, the resolve of the West pretty early on. And um, shortly after the war, he decided that uh, couldn't allow a free West Berlin to exist inside the soviet controlled zone of east germany so uh in order to save face uh, he he wanted it to collapse and uh, fall to soviet control and so he blockaded the city which meant n- no uh train lines or highways or roads were open into the city and so the two million or so um berliners kind of on their own and so the united states and uh, great britain decided that they couldn't allow that to happen so they began uh shipping over you know every day in and day out around the clock uh, they just kept landing airplanes full of supplies uh so that the uh people of West Berlin would not uh would not <clears throat> starve and be forced to you know let the uh, the Soviets in so that talking about the Berlin blockade and this over here is the Berlin airlift all right, so it didn't mean that they like rescued the people; just they brought supplies to them, 
And there was fear that this was going to trigger another war because should uh, the Soviet Union shoot down one of these uh, airplanes, then certainly that'd be an act of war. But never happened. Never happened. So after about a year, uh, Stalin decided that enough was enough, and so he he left it alone, ended the blockade, and so uh, train rails, rail lines, highways were opened back up into the. Uh, into West Berlin, so West Berlin was saved, and that was kind of considered a victory for the West. Um, since the United States couldn't use the UN to fight Soviet uh, aggression, they decided to formulate a new uh, alliance system known as the NATO North Atlantic Treaty Organization, um, which um, would be a, an alliance system, and uh, an attack against one would be an attack against all. The United States would be the uh, Strongest member, <clears throat> and uh, just in case, you know, Eastern Europe uh, or Soviet Union decides to attack, then uh, they've got this um, alliance system put in place, all right? Many people were concerned because of the alliance system played a role in World War One, but this uh, this was seen as uh, the right thing to do. At any rate, um, the countries that were behind the Iron Curtain formulated the uh, Warsaw Pact, um, I don't give it the same kind of credence as I do NATO because NATO is still in existence. And most of the countries that were behind uh, the Iron Curtain are now members of NATO. Uh, the Warsaw Pact was strictly formulated to as, as like a show, you know, uh, to make it look as if the countries were willingly joining uh, with the Soviet Union. All right, so um, early on in the notes in this section, it talks about how the Cold War was this 46-year um, period of conflict between the United States and the Soviet Union and you know, each other's allies. Uh, never once did the Soviet Union and the United States directly go to war. There were some close calls, but um, there were also uh, several what are called proxy wars, so allies... The United States got in fights, got in skirmishes with uh, Soviet allies and vice versa. Uh, and uh, one of the biggest ones uh, that is mentioned here is the uh, Korean War, which uh, after uh, the Japanese were kicked out of China uh, and after China became a communist country in the Chinese Civil War, uh, Korean Peninsula was divided up along the 38th parallel and uh, the north was Soviet or uh, excuse me was communist back and communist controlled and the south was uh, considered free and you know dem democratic and at any rate um, there were some elections and neither side wanted to allow the other side they just didn't want to unify because uh, they were afraid they would lose uh, both sides were afraid they would lose, and so the North invaded, and it was a war that took place in 1950 and 1953. Um, it was a UN action, and it just so happened that the, uh, I guess this, the the Soviet, I'm trying to remember, Soviet representative at the UN, the diplomat, chief diplomat, was wasn't there the day that they voted, so because otherwise he would have vetoed it. But the United States pretty much did all the fighting and funding of this war, but. It ended up being a draw, um, and uh, it's kind of relevant because they got a uh, leader that um, very well could cause uh, World War III, uh, and I'm not kidding either. So I might want to, I don't know, to call the newspapers. I might want to open one of them up once in a while and find out what's going on. At any rate, um, the United States decided they, the reason why they fought that, they were, you know, this is an attempt to try to prevent the spread of, communism and so this is why uh this was the yeah it, it was it was seen as in our best interest uh, uh, to get involved in this war um uh, and uh so did the un united nations this here um is a uh, political cartoon it appeared in an american um, newspaper show just how dangerous the United States and the Soviet Union having uh, atomic and then eventually uh, hydrogen bombs. How dangerous that is because it could lead to uh, Armageddon. 
So, uh, basically what ended up happening, it was, uh, both sides were unwilling to go to war with one another because the, the odds or the, um, the stakes were just too high, um, because, uh, it would pretty much kill everybody on the planet if a uh, nuclear war was to take place. And so the concept is known as mutual deterrence or a mutually assured destruction or MAD for short. Same, same time all this conflict's going on, the Western countries in Europe are deciding that uh, they don't want to fight each other anymore. These two world wars have uh, taken quite a toll, and they want to focus on um, um, revitalization and also lasting peace, and they decide that uh, they need to more or less uh, unite economically in order for that to happen. And so... <clears throat> um, there's several plans. Uh, it's called the Sherman Plan, and then they they sign the uh, uh, the Rome the uh, the Rome Treaty, uh, which is called the ECSC, the European Coal and Steel Community. Basically, they're trying to use economics and free trade, and no tariffs among these European countries, as a way to begin the process of unification, not political unification, but Something that we would call maybe a uh, confederation, very similar to what the uh, Holy Roman Empire was. So each country would have its political sovereignty, but yet it would be less likely to go to war with each other because of, uh, because of all the economic ties. And that if the countries are doing well economically, um, there's you know less opportunity for war. So that was what was going on starting in the 1950s. And we'll talk about it uh, a little bit later when it gets to uh, the 1990s when we, we see the formation of the uh, uh, European Union, all right, um, with a treaty that was signed in 1991, all right. At any rate, this here fella is uh, Nikita Khrushchev. He replaced Joseph Stalin. And after Joseph Stalin's uh, death, he gives a speech before the Communist Party and he basically outs Stalin as a thug and a just basically a brutal tyrant and um, uh, begins to undo a lot of the um, totalitarian apparatus that was existed that existed under uh, Stalin um, weakens the political uh, well the uh, secret police and then uh, it closes down his uh, gulags which were the political prisons up in uh, Siberia that were just known for being absolutely dreadful places. Uh, <clears throat> so all things, and, and, and it, it's called de-Stalinization of the Soviet Union, and he even gets rid of you know many of uh, Stalin's henchmen. But uh, European countries, Western European countries, including the United States, we kind of miscalculate and think that this is total reversal, but it's not. I mean, he's still, you know, interested in maintaining total control of his country, but just not in a brutal fashion, in the same brutal fashion that Joseph Stalin did. So uh, there's a couple of examples, especially the Hungarian uprising, where uh, people behind Iron Curtain believe that they had an opportunity to gain some independence or at least some reforms or, uh, you know, some kind of uh, self-determination, but that was not to be the case. Right? During this time period, the United States um, and the Soviet Union competed directly with one another uh, with regards to uh, you know, science and technology as a way to build more and more sophisticated weaponry. And this here is a uh, picture taken of a Sputnik, which was a Russian satellite, first ever to be launched in outer space in 1957. And that caused the United States to absolutely lose their you-know-what, and uh, founded NASA and uh, made sure that uh, to bol bolster our um, the academic rigor in our high schools uh, and uh, more money being thrown at science and math, all right? So the voodoo sciences uh, become more prominent as a result of the Soviets launching Sputnik, the thought that, that maybe the, the next thing they could do would be be able to, you know, use these satellites to drop atomic bombs down in the United States. So that was a big, uh, big to-do. 
This here is uh, a U-2 spy plane that got shot down. American pilot got captured over uh, Soviet airspace and we were taking pictures of them. And I don't know. It made us look bad. But uh, Oh, here's something interesting. It's called a baby boom. 1945 to 1964 uh, in the United States I don't know there's something like 75 million people born uh, largest generation in uh, American history a lot of people 75 million and that trend was uh, the baby boom took place um, women for whatever reason there was a trend where they just women and men that got married young and they had a lot of children all right, they'd been trending towards, you know, beginning of the century about three kids on average, but it it went back up to about four, four or five kids. Uh, so the uh, fertility rate for women was exceptionally high, but then uh, begins to level off at the end of the 1950s. Uh, and talk a little bit later now, a little bit later, but uh, Europe's going through something called a baby bust which means that they have fallen below the replacement level, which is 2.1. And this is a major demographic problem for uh, uh, Europe because they have what they're no, also known as what's called a welfare state. All the European countries, they have a very, very generous uh, social programs for the poor, the elderly, and free health care. And that, that's extremely expensive, all of those things. And... Um, in order for you to be able to afford it, you have to have uh, more workers working, paying in the, t the taxes, than you have people drawing from it. Well, that system is uh, getting pretty soon going to get reversed. There are going to be more retired people and people on the dole than there are people working. So there will be more people riding in the sled than there are people uh, pushing and pulling the sled. So... That, that that's kind of a major problem that the uh, Europeans have to deal with. This here fella is uh, Fidel Castro. He just died recently. Um, he was a uh, communist uh, dictator. Took over Cuba, Cuba, uh, overthrew uh, other dictator by the what's that guy's name? Batista. Uh, he and uh, or Castro and his little henchman, uh, Che Guevara. When you kids go off to college, you're going to probably see some of those Che Guevara t-shirts. Heck, some of you might even wear them, but I don't understand really why young people wear that. Uh, that guy was like a murderous thug, but he's cool. So uh, people who like to be seen as edgy. Uh, wear those Che Guevara t-shirts, those uh, Alex Topping type that uh, don't really realize what a murderous thug that man was. So how you can celebrate his life, I don't know. But, oh, anyway, I digress. Um, this here is called the Cuban Missile Crisis. Uh, took place 19, uh, what was it, 19... November, November 1962, uh, the Soviet Union used uh, Cuba as a base to install some IC, IC, ICBMs, ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles that could reach uh, the United States and really give them an op. Uh, wouldn't give the United States much of an opportunity to respond, uh, so that kind of would remove the deterrent that we have, the mutual, mutually assured, you know, destruction, or MAD for short. Um, they get rid of that. So anyway, when we found out about this, we blockaded Cuba, uh, or put in a quarantine to prevent them, and then we also had to get them to the Soviets to get the missiles out. We had to. We had to remove some missiles from Turkey, but the press never caught on that story. Or they did. If they did, they didn't write about it because it made JFK look like a, you know, a hero. I mean, he did a good job, no doubt about it. But um, we did have to. There was a quid pro quo. We just didn't get the Soviets to remove the missiles. We had to um, promise to remove our missiles that we had in Turkey, pointing at them. So that's what ended up happening. But uh, 
showed, uh, you know, again, American resolve, the West's resolve to resist uh, the Soviet Union. And so uh, what they also did is they put telephones uh, in the White House and in the uh, Kremlin so that the uh, Soviet premier and the U.S. president can talk to each other because they had to go through all kinds of back channels and they had the hardest time talking to the Soviets and getting messages to Khrushchev and not knowing if it was, you know, the messages were being uh, intercepted and, and whether they were phony or what have you. So installing uh, telephones was actually a pretty good idea so that they could uh, talk to each other. Uh, that's about all I got. I'm a little tired, so I'm going to go ahead and uh, wrap this up and then um, pick up here tomorrow so you all can uh, meet me back here. All right? Sound sound about all right? Okay, well, good.